Okay, Martin, I think I'm going to begin. So, welcome everyone to the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL London. Um, really delighted to be hosting the TAP Intermediate Meeting with this keynote lecture by my colleague, Professor Jane Rendell. Um, I'm going to introduce Jane, um, and then uh, obviously we're very much looking forward to Jane's talk here in the room, but we really encourage you and look forward to hearing the conversation and the questions and the comments for Jane after we finish speaking here. And also do please use the chat, and those of you who are in the room, um, obviously please, we'd love to hear your voices. Jane Rendell is Professor of Critical Spatial Practice at Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL. She introduces concepts of critical spatial practice and site writing through her many authored books, and I'm going to just read a few of them, uh, just to give you the sense of how wide and uh, sophisticated her practice is. So the architecture of psychoanalysis, silver, site writing, art and architecture, and then also the pursuit of pleasure. In her co-edited collections, these include Reactivating the Social Condenser, Critical Architecture, Spatial Imagination, The Unknown City, Intersections, Gender Space Architecture, Strangely Familiar. And between 2015 and this current year, she led the Bartlett's Ethics Commission. This is in combination with her colleague, Dr. David Roberts, and has now led into a larger project, which is one I'm sure she's going to speak to about uh, today. This is called the Ethics of Research Practice, um, a large project with a No Knowledge and Action for Urban Equality project, which they've also undertaken with colleague, Dr. Yael Kazan. I'm really delighted to hand over to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for such a nice introduction, Peg. And, um, just swapping chairs. Hi to everyone in the Zoom room and hello to everyone in the physical room here. Uh, it's my first talk in physical space for two and a half years, so quite a momentous occasion. Can I remember how that feels when you're not in Zoom or on Teams or some other such? Um, and I just also wanted to point out that at the back of the room, I brought along a selection of PhDs that I've supervised over the years, um, mainly from the PhD by design program, but some of them are history theory as well. So feel free to have a look through those um, in the questions, we can talk through any, any questions you might have. I'll refer to that a little bit in passing. It's not the core of what I'm going to talk about, but they're in the room and um, they're, as you can see, incredible pieces of work that need to be looked at and read and enjoyed by people. So they're with me here. Um, so I slightly changed the title of my talk um, from the original one, which was critical spatial practice to site writing, thinking that actually the trajectory I want to talk through is from critical to ethical spatial practice via site writing. So that's what I'm going to try and do in the next um, 45 minutes. So it's a pleasure to meet you all. I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback and um, hope you've been having a good time meeting in person uh, on the programme after two years of not being able to do that. So the term critical spatial practice is something that I introduced in as a concept in around 2003 to indicate an interest in the specifically spatial and critical aspects of interdisciplinary processes that operate between art and architecture. And then I'm going to go on and talk about the development of site writing as a form of situated and critical spatial practice. And then to explorations of more recent work that Peg was referring to around the ethical aspects of critical spatial practice. Um, I'm afraid I am going to read because if I talk off cuff, we could be here for many hours. And I think we'll want to get out and enjoy being in London on such a lovely day. So I'm going to, to give a, a talk to just try and keep it quite um, contained. So a couple of words of introduction at the beginning here. So I'm on Donna's computer, so I'm not doing brilliantly on that. Is it just here? Uh, is it that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so thank you. Um, so I trained originally as an architect um, and worked. What's your name? 
<laughs> well, I'm not sure whether I'm going to stop, discuss that. <laughs> We could detour into that. Uh, perhaps we'll do that a little later in the session. <laughs> okay, well, we'll look, we'll look out for any, any other pop-up questions as they come along. Um, so, yeah, so in the, I, I trained as an architect and worked um, in social housing in the 90s and briefly with the um, Feminist Architecture Cooperative Matrix. Um, and then following an MSc, which I did here, and a PhD at Birkbeck in architectural history, I became an academic, so to speak, initially as a self-proclaimed uh, feminist Marxist architectural historian, and then more latterly working in critical spatial practice and site writing. And I think probably one of the things that um, has fascinated me throughout my research uh, career has been the space between things, trans, transitional spaces, transdisciplinarity, um, different aspects of between the spaces between disciplines, spaces between objects and subjects, and um, transitional spaces in general. But my early, early research really focused on feminist issues, um, both in the pursuit of pleasure and gender space architecture. And the historical work that I did for the pursuit of pleasure, which was my PhD, and I'm going back to that because I know you're in the middle of your PhDs now, so I want you to sort of sketch out how a research trajectory can develop out of a, out of a kind of PhD interest, if you like. So the PhD was called the Pursuit of Pleasure: Gender, Space, and Architecture in Regency London. So that's like the early decades of the uh, early 19th century. And in a way, that project set the scene for many things that I continue to develop. One, that I, it was a study of rambling, which was a, I defined as a gendered spatial practice in terms of the urban movement conducted by young men in 1820s London. That was my object of study, if you like. But also the kind of writing that I developed in the PhD was very start of that kind of writing thinking of feminist architectural history as a form of practice. So that, that was always really important to me that history writing is a, and history investigation, because of my background in, in practice, I think, I tend to see as a form of practice. So that means thinking of it as a methodology as well, thinking about, and this was from a feminist perspective, led by, for me, the work of Lucy Aguri, um, questioning how do we choose the subjects we choose to study um, and what constitutes our subject matter? And then how do we decide uh, what our modes of interpretation are? And this is thinking specifically if one's doing a historical PhD, like picking an object of study and developing an interpretive lens through which to uh, investigate evidence. Hi, Jonna. <laughs> Can I help? I think just check something. It's a full screen sheet. Uh, I thought we were going to start a duet. I don't know. I'll keep going. Is that okay? Yeah, come back, come back if you need to. Um, so my first introduction to uh, site-specific practice was in uh, the mid-90s when I was invited to Chelsea College of Art and Design to teach on and later direct their MA in the theory and practice of public art and design. And I became really fascinated by public art, which struck me as a very unstable form of practice, which insisted on locating itself in this place between fine art and spatial design. Um, and a couple of years later, when I edited this special issue of the Public Art Journal, I was trying to sketch out a relationship between spatial practices that occurred between art and architecture and spatial theories that were being explored by philosophers and cultural geographers um, and looking at that place between spatial theory and spatial practice. And for several years after the publication um, of that journal, I continued to position myself in this place between art and architecture and theory and practice and explore the patterning of those relationships. 
So this is really where I came up with this term critical spatial practice to try and describe a kind of terrain of projects that might occur between these modes of practice and the standpoints that practice might have for developing theoretical and conceptual positions. So the art and architecture book really tries to look at a specific form of practice, one that's critical and spatial. So for me, this is practices that intervene into sites in order to call into question and try to make visible the social and cultural forces that might be at work in the site. Um, as well as the disciplinary boundaries through which these projects might be operating. So I argue that in the book that critical spatial practice occurs at a triple crossroads between art and architecture, between public and private, and between theory and practice. And I'm not going to go into these in detail here. Um, but I also try to draw out the, the criticality, the spatiality, and the interdiscipline, it's interdisciplinarity of the practices. And this is because, for me, the definition of criticality is something that I draw from Frankfurt School theory, and because it has a double definition within Frankfurt School theory, theory which is that the critical is both self-reflective, so it draws attention to the type of processes that we use, in, in, insisting really on a self-reflectivity around processes, which in a sense we might think of as a shift from method to methodology. Methodology being, for me, the philosophy of method. It's what happens when you become self-reflective about your, your method or your process. But also, and really importantly, in Frankfurt School uh, critical theory, Criticality is also has a social emancipatory intention. So for, for those Frankfurt School critical theorists, Horkheimer, Marcuse, Adorno, Benjamin, and so on, and they work obviously in very different ways, um, the critique was class critique. Whereas I think it's possible to extend critical theory, and not everyone would agree with me by far here. In fact, the post-critical movement would particularly disagree with, with wanting to push forward from Frankfurt School theory, but I remain um, believing that it's possible to do that, but to draw it, you know, critical race theory, uh, feminism as, as a kind of critical gender theory, that it's possible to take certain things from Frankfurt School theory and push out and develop and extend them. The spatial for me, obviously, perhaps as an architect is very important. And in the book, I was particularly looking not really at gendered spatial theory, um, though I've later developed work around feminist critical spatial practices. But in the art and architecture book, I was particularly looking at the Sato's work and the Fair, because they both make distinctions between spatial practices that work within dominant power, power paradigms and those that resist dominant power paradigms. I mean, for, for Dusseto, he has this logic of strategic spatial practices that work in the service of power and tactical spatial practices that kind of work against power. And I think perhaps I've oversimplified there for those of you who've read any of Dusseto's work, it's much more complicated than that. It's not a binary setup and these two things interact in many different ways. But for me, it was helpful to start thinking that you could have these critical spatial practices. I mean, perhaps looking back on it, it would have been easier to just talk about spatial praxis, because in Marxism, critical practice is actually praxis with an XIS, but we could, we could come back to that. Interdisciplinarity, very important uh, to this work, not just in terms of multidisciplinarity, i.e., lots of disciplines working together to problem solve, which is very important and works in a lot of ways, often in cross science projects or cross social science projects, but interdisciplinarity specifically emerging from humanities, where people are critiquing their own disciplinary methods by encountering one discipline through another, it's possible to understand the limits um, and possibilities of one's discipline and become much more um, cognizant of the possibilities and the fact that one might be located within a discipline. There's also another aspect to interdisciplinarity which interested me uh, still 
through the work of Julia Kristeva, where she talks about interdisciplinarity as a site where expressions of resistance are latent. Um, and she argues that this might be uh, part of a tendency to jealously protect one's own domain. Uh, this is an interview from the late 90s. Specialists do not teach their students to construct a diagonal axis in their methodology. So it's a very interesting quote. I'm not going to unpack the whole thing here, but she's talking about the diagonal, the bias as a cutting across and a cutting through. In fact, one might start to think that she's talking about transdisciplinarity here. We could have a conversation around the, the distinctions between those two, inter and transdisciplinarity as well. But I think what really caught my attention was the jealously protect one's own domain. Seemed quite a strong statement. And she goes on to describe um, the unconscious processes at work in interdisciplinarity, which I found really, really interesting, and questions of things like resistance. So I think there's a very interesting um, area that she opens up about the emotionality of interdisciplinary work. And you certainly see looking across how different colleagues and students and academics work in an interdis interdisciplinary terrain that some people are really drawn to it. They love the idea of kind of giving up their specialist knowledge and being an amateur and trying something out in another domain. Other people find that really quite nerve wracking and not something that they appreciate. And that can also change according to what disciplines we're talking about and also the point in someone's career. Um, you know, is, is suddenly becoming an amateur in a discipline a great idea at the beginning of the PhD programme when one's supposedly becoming a specialist? So I think these, these are interesting questions that one could look at in more detail. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole book by any stretch here. Um, sorry, John, I'm not very good on this computer. Next, that's I'll do next. Okay. <laughs> it's not that it's recognized that my fingerprint isn't the same as yours. No. <laughs> Just wondering, what would the tacit knowledge of it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, do you know exactly? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So some of the people whose work feature in the book include Smithson, Herzog and de Murren, Sarah Wigglesworth, Merla Lederman, uh, Euclid Lederman, Joseph Boyce and Muff Architect. So the book was published in 2006 and obviously things have moved on a lot since then um, in many different ways. Uh, certainly from my perspective, I've I decided to set up a, a website, criticalspatialpractice.org, where I curate um, and invite people to share projects around different themes of critical spatial practice. And some of them include ex-master's students, ex-PhD students, but also other practitioners internationally who want to share work on, on this platform. So it's very much a platform for sharing different types of critical spatial practice project. And what's also really nice is students coming to it from other programs around the world, also wanting to put their projects there. So I have to say, I have quite an open process to the, to the curation of it because I see it very much as a really helpful uh, pedagogical tool. And there's also you know, some really great projects on here that, that come to my attention. Um, as really interesting examples of critical spatial practice from the work of someone like Bridget McClear, who's a fine artist, to Jan Katine, an architect, and onto Camilo Buono, who uh, just produced a really fantastic book in Italian on minor architecture and did a lovely short translation in English for, for the website. Um, I mean, critical spatial practice also is something that I find has been a very helpful um, conceptual framing for the work of many of my PhD students, some of whom their work features on the critical spatial practice site, because what I wanted to try and do, there's a little section called PhD exemplars, was to try and draw out um, 
two particular aspects of practice-led uh, PhD. So the PhDs that I supervise in architectural design can vary from speculative work to you know, participatory practice. Also in fine art, from site-specific installations to gallery exhibition work, and also take place through film and all different forms of writing practice, including poetry. So in a design PhD, the original contribution to knowledge is often through the development of a new form of methodology or process. And so the critical spatial practice frame, sometimes people find that really helpful as a way of thinking how to locate their, their work. Um, and some of the things that I don't tend to have a, a mode of supervision, which is um, where I ask people to follow a particular method in that sense. People, I tend to supervise by encouraging people to make work and then thinking after they've made work, what's going on in the work that, that's being made. And so what emerges out of that often towards maybe the point that some of you might be at is what I call the good enough structure which is a kind of holding mechanism. It's the structure that works well enough to be able to advance the PhD towards the end. It may need some revision, it may not be perfect, but it's good enough to hold everything together. Because in a design PhD, you may have projects and you may have writing. And quite often I don't encourage people to just write a set of chapters with a project portfolio, but rather to interweave the writing and the projects together. And that's why I brought the PhDs to you to see because every single one, and this is what's such a wonderful world to be able to have the, the joy of supervising these projects, every single one comes out differently. And that's what's so exciting. Each person finds their own voice, the way they want to write about their work. And each person comes up with an original structure. So I see the structure as also being a really important contribution to knowledge. I'm actually not going to go through any of the PhDs here because they're on the table and I know I'm already running out of time. So, um, so what intrigues me in terms of critical spatial practice now is thinking about what I call seven adjustments. So in many ways, my thinking's moved from inter to transdisciplinarity. Um, actually coming out of a comment by a student in a, a seminar, um, who said, well, where's time gone in critical spatial practice? I think the temporality of critical spatial practice is really fascinating. There's the importance of scale for work, how one works from detail through to strategy or vice versa. There's the question of the effectiveness of critique. In a way, this is a kind of answering back to uh, where is Frankfurt School theory in, crit in critique today? and um, something called constructive institutional critique, which I will come to at the end of the talk, and a really beautiful idea um, of instituent um, critique. Uh, so I'm very much thinking about what exactly is, um, what exactly is criticality and how does, it, how does it function? Work on feminist critical spatial practices, um, and then the last two are the ones that I want to focus on today. One is really the practice of sight writing that I've been developing. And then the other is how the critical might move towards the ethical. And if you want to read the seven adjustments in more detail, um, I had the opportunity to, to write about that in this really interesting book edited by Jonathan Bean, Susanna Dickinson and Althea Ida from a conference they did a few years ago on critical practices in architecture. So I've, I've set that set of readjustments out in an essay for their, for their book here. So site writing, what, what on earth is that? What am I talking about when I talk about site writing? Well, site writing um, emerged for me towards the end of writing the art and architecture book. So I became really aware in that book that I was, um, structuring the book as a study of other people's critical spatial practices, other people's projects, whether they were artists, architects, urbanists. And I don't feel I ever particularly trained as a critic. And I sort of found myself when I was writing that book becoming a critic. That's how the publishers wanted to position it. But I felt that actually the practice of criticism was itself something that is situated 
Um, it doesn't play, take place nowhere. It takes place in particular locations, in particular sets of relation, um, might set up, perhaps Peg would describe it in terms of ecolog ecologies. So I started to think, well, what is this writing of criticism? And I kind of came up with site writing because, sorry, what is this writing of criticism that's situated? And I came up with site writing because at the time, it's not so sort of popular now, but there was a very strong movement of art hyphen writing. I don't know if people were aware of it, which was taking place with the work of people like um, Gavin Butt and Mika Bal, referring back to the work of someone called David Carrier, who's a really interesting art critic, on the cusp of art criticism in Butt's book called After Criticism. It's a whole question of, is there still a distinct difference between criticism and practice. And so the art writing project kind of a, um, sits at this kind of um, meeting point, really, of criticism and practice. And so that's where um, site writing uh, came from. The argument really is for me that encounters with um, art and architectural works happen in situ, critical responses take place somewhere. Um, site specificities in themselves are situated and produce spatial conditions and situations. So I started arguing by the end of the art and architecture book that criticism must itself be recognized as a form of critical spatial practice and one which acknowledges its own situatedness. I've written about this in more detail in an in a essay for a recent issue of Log magazine on expanded modes of practice in an essay called site, situation, and other forms of situatedness. So this is very much a kind of truncation of that discussion, but I was trying to think through site as something which could be defined in physical and material terms, a situation as something that is both spatial and temporal. And in that essay, I go back to um, the, the situationists and their idea of constructed situations. A situation could also be a location of something in space and a set of circumstances bounded in time. The conditions of a particular instant, a moment, event, so highly temporal. And then interestingly, the associated verb to situate describes the action of positioning something in a particular place, while the adjective, obviously I'm afraid this is very much in English grammar, situated, define something site or situation. So situatedness then is a way of engaging with the qualities of these processes of situating or being situated. And the other thing that's very interesting about situating is it's also a potentially a reflexive verb or, and a self-reflexive verb. So you can situate, but you can also be situated, which is quite interesting. So it can something that can happen to you. Um, in expanding postmodern and post-structural discussions of subjectivity, scholars in feminist geography and philosophy have often relied on spatial metaphors to emphasize this importance of physical location and social position to the construction of gender, sexuality, and subjectivity. This continues in really interesting ways in intersectional work and critical race theory today. And in her 1988 essay, Situated Knowledges, Donna Haraway argued most memorably that feminist objectivity means quite simply situated knowledge. So many people often think that this Situated Knowledges essay of Haraway is a shift from objectivity to subjectivity. But in fact, what she's arguing for is a situated objectivity. Um, and I think her essays become perhaps the most quoted uh, of work on situated knowledge from that period. But there are many, many other writers who were working in that way, and many women of colour writers in particular. Um, someone like Bell Hooks' work, I think, really important. Uh, she never describes her work as situated knowledge, but I think the writing that she does is very much around those issues. Um, sort of parallel to a philosophical conversation about situatedness in the 1990s um, in kind of anglophone um, art practices the term site became very charged with a critical valency 
So working outside the gallery and often in urban conditions, um, artists started to embrace this term site specific to describe a particular form of practice. And perhaps the most kind of uh, quoted uh, important books that comes from that period from 2002 is Nihon Kwon's One Place After Another, Site Specific Art and Locational Identity. So what, what she does in this book is she tries to sketch an outline of the history of the development of a number of approaches to site in contemporary art practice, from phenomenological to ex an experiential to critical and then more discursive. Um, and in a way, she also raises quite a strong critique um, that many, and this is the title of the piece, one the work, for the book, one place after another. She's sometimes arguing that artists don't look closely enough, critically enough, at what it means to use and work within site specificity. But nonetheless, I think it's an important place marker because it starts to make visible and define site-specific practice as a kind of genre, really. Um, another important reference for me is, all, is uh, Umberto Eco's Poetics of the Open Work from 62, because what Eco's doing here is drawing attention to the performative manifestations of interpretive attitudes. And this led me to suggest the importance of sight in informing the performance of the critic's interpretation. So it's thinking about interpretation as a form of practice and as a form of situated practice. And another important reference, and, and these aren't simply works that I'm following, I also offer a critique really of Claire Bishop's installation art book, another fantastic book, which also puts installation art out there as, as a genre. Um, and she talks about um, installation art, her definition for it as a genre is the degree of proximity that it offers between what she calls the model subject that the artist has in mind when producing the installation and the literal viewer. So there's this really interesting um, distance potentially between ideals and models and literal experiences. But what I, what I and, and, and she argues that that provides a, crit a criterion of its aesthetic judgment for installation art. But what I became really interested in here was how the critic fitted into that and how and what the relationship was between the critic as a model subject and the critic as a literal viewer. So I wanted to draw attention to the critic as a precise category of viewing subject with the responsibility to interpret and perform the work for another audience. And as such, the critic occupies a discrete position as a mediator between artwork and viewer. And I think that could be a helpful thing to think, to think about if you're conducting a practice-led PhD, where you're also expected to write about and comment somehow on your own practice. How do you mediate that relationship between practitioner and critic and in, in critic of your own practice and your own work? And I think the PhDs that I brought out really try and explore that as a, as a site of investigation. So site writing was a term that I coined in 2005 as this kind of shorthand for highlighting criticism as a form of critical spatial practice one that is self-reflective concerning its own methods and which intervenes into textual and other sites in order to uh, provide social critique. As a writer based in the discipline of architecture, my interest has been in how criticism in performing these acts of interpretation situates itself as a practice and how the change in material, conceptual, emotional, ideological positions and sites of criticism produce and are in turn produced by interpretive and performative acts. The desire to work with variations in voice to try and reflect and create spatial distances and proximities between works and texts, between artists, writers and readers became the motivation for pursuing a particular mode of pedagogical 
and written political spatial practice. And so that kind of culminated in this collection of essays um, from 2011 called Site Writing, The Architecture of Art Criticism. In the book, I'm trying to explore the possibilities for this situated form of criticism, one that invites critics to consider the sites and situations through which they encounter their objects of critique, materially, politically, subjectively. The sites and situations are embodied through the ways in which one first engages with an artwork, which might be in a book, in a gallery, on the internet, and so on, and then made manifest through the sites and situations we adopt in language to describe this engagement. In the positions associated with writers' choices of pronouns, I, she, they, you, to the very pages on which the words are printed and the fonts that the words may be printed in. So considering the situatedness of criticism, this can take us from the site through which a critic investigates a work to the ways in which a critical essay is published and meets its audience. This particular take on criticism as situated practice encourages processes of interpretation to be understood as produced by, as well as productive of, the sites and situations in which they relate as well as the ways in which they're performed through the very processes of criticising. So there's a whole range of different types of projects in the book, from a project like Confessional Constructions, which is an intervention, a text-based intervention into a site, to May Morn, which was a uh, gallery installation, but was made in response to uh, a triptych piece by Alina Brothers called, Long, called Spring. I won't go into all the details here, but just to point out that some of the work is um, site-specific intervention in the form of a text and others are responses to other people's artworks. And I'm going to just um, read aloud from one piece to just give you a sense of how that might work. So the intention with the site writing is to try and operate in a relational space between the critic and the other which could be the site of inquiry as a place, an artwork, a piece of architecture, but also between the written work produced and the way it meets its reader. So the, the aim in a way is to try and shift the relationship of the critic from one of mastery, the object of study, writing about something at a distance to writing to the object, so dialogue or with, the object, um, increasingly a kind of collective writing that I've been engaged with, or also writing as the object, equivalence, and that's the piece I'm going to read you now. So what happens if one tries to make a piece of writing that is somehow like a site, like an artwork, like an object, how would one do that? Um, and it relates a little bit to the history of a practice of expresis, a classical practice, where one tries to, in poetry, recreate the qualities of an object or artwork in some way. So if all of us were trying to do a site writing of this room, trying to do a writing that remade our position, individual positions in this room and understanding of what this room means to each one of us, we would each produce a very different form of writing in the room. Not only the content that we would write about, but perhaps the different things that feature in the room from the different architectural configurations to the different screens. There are so many different cues and prompts that each one of us would pick up and interpret things in a different way. And that's why I think that this practice of remaking a site in writing always has so much potential because it's, it's not the same for each person. And that's what brings out the, crit the criticality in a way. How am I doing on time? We've got 20 minutes. 20 well, no, minutes. we've got to finish for six, we're fine. Oh, we're so fine. Okay, no, that's no great. Restriction okay. Time, Perfect, thanks. Okay, so I'm just going to give a little example because what I've described to you is very um, theoretical. It's quite a warm day. You've had quite a long day and I could feel, even as I'm reading it, that it could just be sort of drifting past. So I'm going to do a bit of a reading to kind of bring us back into it. So it's from an essay called To Miss the Desert, 
um, which I wrote in response to an artwork by an artist called Nathan Coley called Black Tent, um, which was curated by Gavin Wade for um, a show called Art and Sacred Spaces. And the excerpt is called Around the Edge. The bathroom has a floor of polished marble, black, interwoven with white veins. Perched on the toilet with her feet dangling off the ground, she traces the white lines with her gaze. She keeps alert for cockroaches. At any time, one might crawl through the cracks, around the edge of the room, and into the blackness. 14 floor finishes, location G6. Lay new flooring, 300 mil by 300 mil, terracotta, unglazed tiles with sandstone colour grout, 10 mil wide joints. All tiles to be laid out from centre line, finished floor level to match G5. All the, all the floors are marble, smooth and cool, laid out in careful grids, except for the big golden rug next to the sofa. She likes to follow its intricate patterns with her feet like paths around a secret garden. But if you dance around the edges of the squares, you mustn't be silly enough to fall in. Who knows what could lie in wait for you in an enchanted garden? Along one edge of her garden are a number of small rooms. These are home to Gulen and Karim. They fought each other in the past and will fight again when the Soviets come to Kabul. And then again when her own people search the Hindu Kush to wipe out all evil. But for now, there's no fighting. Once the sun has gone down, we sit and eat together. He's a man with property and wives. Inside the walls of his house are sunlit orchards with trees full of dark purple fruit. A group of women dressed in different shades of red watch them arrive. Some have covered their faces, but she can still see pink nail varnish on their toes. And as her family draws closer, the women disappear. 14 floor finishes, location 1.5 and G5. Four bone air lino sheeting, 1.5 mil to be laid on 6 mil WVP ply subfloor. Ply and lino to run under appliances and around kitchen units, colour TBA by client. Aluminium threshold at junction with G2, G6 and 1.1. They sit upstairs in the long veranda overlooking the garden. The only furniture is a carpet laid out in a line down the middle of the room. Important men from the village, all in turban, sit cross-legged around the edges of the carpet and eat from the dishes laid out between them. Her mother, her sister and herself are the only women. And as they walk back down through the dark house to leave, she sees a pair of eyes watching her from behind a screen. The eyes belong to a girl, a girl with the hands of a woman, a woman who glints with silver. And later she learns that this is Corrine's youngest wife, once a nomad, who carries her wealth in the jewels on her fingers. So that's just a short excerpt. Um, the others are all entitled, you know, with um, spatial, spatial prepositions, like uh, I think around the air, around the middle, um, down the center and so on. Um, but as well as you know, writing a piece of prose, which I really enjoyed writing, the prose was actually trying to operate in a very particular way critically. So Black Tent had developed out of Nathan Coley's interest in religious structures in general, but particularly the evocative, very precise description of the construction of the tabernacle that's given in the Bible. Gavin Wade, the curator, had read a piece of my writing where I questioned whether it was possible to write architecture rather than write about architecture. And so he invited me to write a tabernacle. I felt that the text in the Bible was already a writing of the tabernacle. And so I decided to write Black Tent, so to write the art project. Black Tent consists of this flexible structure, a number of steel framed panels with black fabric screens stretched, stretched across them. Small colored squares and transparent windows crisscrossed with stitching are inserted into the screens and Black Tent moved to a number of different sites in the town of Portsmouth, including two in the cathedral, um, I think a school, a shopping center and a park, reconfiguring itself for each location. The essay I wrote echoes 
aspects of black tent. So it tries to, you know, do that ex-phrasis work on black tent. And the things that I picked up on are the differing configuring of the panels, depending on their situation. So for that reason, each section of the essay, I think there were five essays because this, the artwork moved to five different sites, is given a spatial condition, such as the one that I read to you around the edge. My essay, like Coley's work, also explores the nature of boundary conditions, so specific and ge generic boundary conditions, political and personal, material and psychic. Paralleling Coley's interest in the bounded site of the religious sanctuary, my spatial motifs are the secular sanctuaries of home and refuge. So in a way, I say paralleling, but actually this is where the critical interpretation happens because I kind of wanted to take issue with this idea that the sanctuary could be located within a Judeo-Christian um, tradition, and especially looking at this piece that was in the church. So I wanted to locate it in a secular tradition, so thinking about domesticity and home in the writing, but also within Islamic culture and within the Middle East. So the narrative that I set up has, um, I also wanted to parallel this idea of a, a kind of square with two, a screen with two sides. So there were these two different voices, which I'm sure you picked up on, pitched against each other to try and create a dynamic between private and public sanctuary. So one voice remembers a childhood spent in various nomadic cultures and countries in the Middle East. The other voice uses a more professional tone to describe <coughs> various sanctuaries at different scales and stages of the design process. So the specifications that I read out for you derived from construction details that I produced when designing contemporary sanctuaries when I was actually working for Matrix, a specific uh, set of community buildings for different uh, so-called minority groups. So that was the reason that I composed the essay in that way, uh, to try and pick up on these aspects of sanctuary, but to, to offer a, a critique of it as well. But then as with much of my work, the, the essay became something else in another location when it moved site. And this was part of a project. The next phase, I'm not going to talk about it in detail, just to show you some images of it. It became another work with an embellishment perda, because I think really the importance of that screen that I describe in the narrative uh, and the woman behind it. Um, and this was a project that Peg and I worked on together back in the day, spatialimagination.org. <laughs> and a show that our colleague Penelope Haralambadu uh, curated with 14 different artists and, and architects and writers at the Domo Bal Gallery in London. So in that show, my own work was this piece called An Embellishment Perda, which sat both in the catalogue uh, to the show and in the window at the front of the gallery. So um, I selected 12 short extracts from the two Miss the Desert piece, this is just a little part of one of them. And that's what produced this kind of uh, sort of 12 scenes um, in this text. And then in the window of the gallery, and it was 12 scenes because of the construction of the gallery window in these 12 panels in this sash window, I wrote the word perda um, in, in black uh, coal, in black eyeliner, in the script of Afghanistan's official language at Dara in the window. I'm not going to talk about that in more detail, but just to say that I suppose for me, a lot of, a lot of my work, work operates like this. I'll leave a project for a bit and then I'll come back to it and remake it for another site. And I've always wanted to, to remake this work. And actually, I hope I will at some point, but as a, as a collaborative piece. Um, and just then to say something about site writing as a pedagogical practice, some people in the room have experienced that. Um, so I managed to dig out this interesting document the other day, um, DG4, Dissertation Group 4, from 2001. So it's a definitely historical archive document at this point. And this was, I think, the first time I ever taught um, site writing. And I called it site-specific writing in the reading room. Um, and it was, yeah, really great fun to teach this. So 
the first teaching of site-specific writing happened as part of the um, part two course, the professional training uh, for architects. But what I wanted to do was try and break down the boundary between studio practice and seminar theory to show how practice is a mode of thinking and how there might be theoretical and critical approaches to conceptual design. So the way I set the brief out for the students was to think about how writing can respond to physical, social and political qualities of sight, how writing can be inserted back into a site and make encounters with readers in so doing. Um, so there was the chance to experiment with the different material qualities and processes at work in the site, as well as its history and how people could transpose those into writing. Um, and this was kind of the first ex pedagogical experiment, if you like, and that went on to a number of other different briefs. Travel writing was one, the reading room I really enjoyed, which is a slightly different version to this one. Um, and then the module that I teach with Polly Gold and David Roberts now, which sits between the MA Situated Practice and the MA Architectural History. And I've written a couple of essays that kind of draw out the potential for site writing pedagogy for urban design in this book here, edited by Matthew Carmona with some examples of student projects. And then in this book, um, which is actually an edited book by Murray Fraser. Sorry, you can't quite see Murray's name there on design research in architecture. Um, I don't think I'm going to go through all of this now, but what I tried to do in the book for Matthew was just um, produce a summary of what the different possibilities were for thinking about how to do a site, how to do a site writing, what things people might think about in their um, work if they wanted to create a site writing. So, you know, they vary from thinking about materiality uh, of book production, which I'm really interested in, thinking about um, how to blend different writing styles, personal and academic styles, how to develop different kinds of voice. Um, I think the idea of a journey is often very interesting. Journeys can be really helpful for constructing site writings because they also help you work in dialogue between what's outside in the world and your inner, inner emotional state. Thinking about how you might work between writing and designing um, and how you might even start to generate new genres of writing yourself and look at different forms of writing from guidebooks to diaries to letters and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of very exciting work that I've gathered together on the site writing website, which is a kind of sister website to the critical spatial practice one from ex student projects like this amazing site writing, uh, which is a long ribbon of writing with Valeria in your, in your group. Anna, Anna produced a beautiful book as well um, around water and mapping. Um, very lovely piece by another student which actually remade an object from the British uh, Museum that was absent at the time and remade it um, looking at the history of um, political history of, of Iraq. Very nice kind of folded writing which looked at, uh, did a site writing based on Donald Judd's 15 um, untitled works in concrete in Martha, Texas and a piece of writing in relation to each one. Lenny now works actually, Lenny Rosecki, at the um, Architects uh, Architecture Review, uh, which is doing some really interesting commissioning of interesting criticism these days. And quite often what happens in the module is students then decide to curate a show of work, which we offer mentoring and support for either physical shows, which we had before COVID, and hopefully we'll have again, on a set of site writing tables that often saw themselves in the many strikes that have occurred through this period. And some beautiful websites, Refracted Sites um, is one, and then this very lovely one that I think Jono has some work in too, Echoes and Intersection from last year's students. And we will meet tomorrow to decide what we might do this time round. And then there are some great projects from other practitioners and writers around the world on the website as well. Um, and a kind of addition that I then came up with, which I, I think it's now onto its 12th edition, is the site reading writing quarterly 
Um, this is a, a website where I am really interested in curating different ways of writing reviews. So trying to think of the review essay also as a form of situated criticism, situated practice. So each solstice and equinox, I invite two writers who've recently published a book to, they can be an edited book or an authored book or co-authored work to swap works and to respond to each other's work in a situated way. Um, and we're just about to issue, no, I think it's issue 11 um, on, on, the, on the solstice on June the 21st. So there's a whole range of just fascinating dialogues that emerge between people. Um, they often don't plan how they'll do things. Sometimes they do. There's actually a beautiful conversation between two feminist art historians, Penny Florence and Marsha Miss Timmon, which was a Zoom dialogue about two books on ecology that they and art which they produced around the same time. That was issue four. Some people produce drawings, others produce sound works. It depends. It always comes out differently. And that's what's so exciting about it. So it's really just trying to explore the idea of the review as a, as a form of situated practice. And this was the last issue that we did. Um, so I'll end now with just a few words to, to, on, on the ethical spatial practice. So this is the seventh adjustment, if you like. Um, and I've written about this in much more detail in this essay here, Hotspots and Touchstones from Critical to Ethical Spatial Practice, um, which is in a very nice special issue of the Journal of Architecture and Culture, issue uh, edited by Lawrence Cohn and Cameron McEwen on collective life from the ARA conference that they did on the topic. Um, so what I try and talk about in this, in this paper is how an experience in my own life, which I call a, a hotspot, led to a new form of practice, solo and collaborative. Solo in the form of um, articles that I've written and, and books, but also and importantly collaborative with other colleagues around UCL and beyond um, in the form of conferences, seminars on ethical practice with PhD students and others, fora with, um, this was with the London Mining Network led by a PhD student of mine, Deanna Salazar, that I worked with, uh, speech extractions um, that invited communities affected by mining to come to UCL. I'll explain a little bit why that was such a focus in a second. And then this being part of this quite incredible no knowledge in action for urban equality project which was led by colleagues uh karen levy and others from the dpu and was very kindly asked to lead a, a work package on ethics of research practice with uh, dr yale padan and then the work that i've been doing over many years with dr david roberts for the bartlett's ethics commission and the final piece of work along with many other things that we've produced in terms of chapters and writing is, is this website that David designed and produced and that I curated called Practicing Ethics, which is intended as a, a kind of uh, pedagogical tool and tool for researchers. So it brings together ethical principles written by, I think, about 30 different people. Um, I wrote a few, the situatedness one is mine. Um, and some amazing guides, again, written by other colleagues around how to think ethically when engaged in particular kinds of research process. So David did one on making images and staging research, Yale on interviewing um, and co-producing knowledge. Another uh, PhD student from the DPU, Ariana Markovic, did one on, a really brilliant one on, on risk and well-being. It's a superb piece of work and brilliant colleague, Emmanuel Osutsi, who's now a lecturer at DPU on researching international, internationally. We also have a couple of more later ones on co-writing and on secondary data. So it's an expanding set um, where we designed a template and um, then each uh, author uh, thinks through the different ethics Different, different ethical implications of different kinds of research practice. Um, 
for me, the starting point of this was um, came out of a, a rather difficult experience in my life, which I've written about in the book Silver, um, which began on the 11th of June, 2011. Um, yeah, I, how much time have we got, Meg? <laughs> I would say perhaps five, ten, five, 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 ten yeah, minutes. definitely, I'll be yeah. done with that, definitely. So, so this is the hot spot for me, uh, which was this handshake that occurred between Malcolm Grant, who was then the provost of UCL, and Andrew McKenzie, who was the CEO of BHP Billiton. I didn't know that the handshake had occurred, but it was there in, in UCL PR on the website. Um, and I found out... Um, that what this handshake was about was UCL's decision to accept $10 million of funding from BHP Billiton to create an energy policy institute <laughs> at Adelaide, University of South Australia, which doesn't exist anymore, and the Institute for St Sustainable Resources in London, which is part of the Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment. And important to say that the Institute of Sustainable Resources accepts and has funding from many different sources, including ESRC, EPSRC, and does some incredible work. But it was also accepting this particular tranche of money from BHP. Um, at the time, I had a role uh, as Vice Dean of Research. Uh, it wasn't consulted on the decision, and I found that I disagreed with it because I felt that you couldn't take money from a fossil fuel company to do work on sustainability a particular view, which many colleagues didn't share. I won't go into all the details here, it's in the silver book. People have very, very different views on this. Some people think you can do good with, with bad money. Some people think that money doesn't have a good or bad ethical value, it's just money. Some people think that state money can be as problematic as private corporate money. So it began some very, very interesting conversations with senior managers at UCL and a, whole journey that I had never expected would happen. Um, it's certainly not a plan that I had for my life that I would get caught up in this, but I did. And I felt I had to stand down from my institutional role as vice dean of research because of it. So I, I kind of decided to make it a, a, a kind of, I guess you would look, look at it now and think it was a kind of whistleblowing, really. But I had very little idea of, of what I was doing as I um, in, embarked upon it. And that's why the collaborative work became so important, because people came to me and said, you can't do this kind of thing on your own. You have to work with others. It's a collective project. So I worked with all kinds of different groups, including the amazing fossil uh, free um, student group at UCL to try and get UCL to divest. It's been a, in re really quite an incredible journey. And, Many, many years later, UCL did decide to divest, which happened about two years ago. So that, that was good. And they decided not to accept a second tranche of money from Billiton. So that was also good. But there may be other reasons to that. Um, but what it also allowed them to do was to think about these kind of ethical qualities of sight writing. Um, Michel Foucault's work on ethics, and particularly his work on something called Parisia, which is really about we might describe it as speaking truth to power or truth speaking. Um, and his work on something called self-writing as what he calls an ethopoetic practice. So I started to become very interested in this and to make my own acts of questioning the corporate funding of university research part of my own writing, both personal and institutional. So in 2015, when I was invited to be a thinker in residence at the Tasmanian College of the Arts in Hobart, Australia, I decided to combine the visit to Australia, all the air miles that that um, entailed, with research visits to a number of sites connected to BHP Billiton. So it's like a kind of pilgrimage, reverse pilgrimage or something like this. I, I, I felt that I had to understand more about this corporation in some, in some senses. So I went to Broken Hill, which is the birthplace of BHP Billiton, often known as Silver City, in the barrier ranges of, of South Australia, which just started with the discovery of a mineral load, which in silver, hence, it's, hence this name, Silver City. And while I was in Australia and in, in Tasmania, I met two incredible artists called Justy Phillips and Margaret Woodward, 
And they were just starting a amazing initiative called the published event in which they explore the spatial, temporal and aesthetic processes of publishing. So it's really looking at publishing as, a, as an art form. And they, I would really encourage you to look at their work. It's, it's quite incredible. And they invited me to join a new project they were just beginning called Lost Rocks. And Lost Rocks had a, a lovely start in life, which was they'd found this board in a secondhand shop in Tasmania of all the rocks of Tasmania. But unfortunately, 40 of the 56 Tasmanian, Tas Tasmanian rocks had fallen off the board. Um, so what Justine and Mags decided to do was invite artists and writers to respond to a chosen lost rock. Um, and I was very, very lucky to uh, be quite early in this project. So I was able to choose silver um, and to write what Justy calls a fictionella. So for, for Justy, a fictionella is a version of a novella, so a mini novel, but not made up like fiction, but she says made with lived experience. So the fictionella. So my fictionella, Silver, starts in two ways. Firstly, with um, the story about the origin of Silver City that's presented in the Albert Kernston Mining and Minerals Museum, what they call the Geo Center in, um, in Silver City in Broken Hill. And that has this kind of quote explaining how the rock formation specific to the Aboriginal land of Willu Willu Yong came into being according to indigenous myth on which the finds of Broken Hill were pegged out. So if you can't quite see it, it says, at each stop, the blood that dripped from the Marupees for the bronze winged pigeon's wounds soaked into the ground, forming the unusual geological landforms we see today. And it's actually quite strange. I wish I'd got a picture of it, but BHP Billiton's logo is actually drops. It's drops of oil, but they're a very strange kind of rusty red color. So there's a sort of slightly odd thing going on there. Um, but I also decided to look at the um, atomic structure of silver. So it's, you know, I mean, practice is very... Um, a, a kind of schematic uh, structure. I'm sure a, an atomic physicist would not agree with this structure, but one could describe, it's this atomic number is 47, and then it has these electrons, 47 electrons arranged on shells, um, two, and then eight, 18, 18, and then one on the outermost section. So I decided to use that structure to structure the, Fictionella. So the first section is called Star Cross Beginnings Twice. In the Silver Age in eight takes, a two sided tale 18 times. In Silver City, 18 scenes. And then Une Prise de Foire just the once. Um, and the four Fictionellas were the first four from the series of Lost Rocks were launched in March 2017 at an exhibition called Crokite, Crokite, Silver, Silver, Lead, which Justine and Margaret uh, curated at the West Coast Heritage Centre in Zeehan, which is on the west coast of Tasmania, for uh, a larger show called Sites of Love and Neglect for a festival called Ten Days on the Island in Tasmania. And Zeehan is an old mining town in the west of Tasmania, um, founded on silver by a magnet, also involved in the establishment of Broken Hill and BHP. So for my contribution, um, I decided to rewrite the silver novella, Fictionella, into a courthouse drama. So I extracted text from the Fictionella and reconfigured them as a script, written in response to the architecture <laughs> of the courthouse in the West Coast Heritage Center, where in the past legal proceedings relating to Zeehan took place. So the courthouse has these very clearly labeled positions, witness box, magistrate, clerk of court, police prosecutor, lawyer, and defendant. And my script contained a list, just give you a little glimpse of what it looks like here. Um, contained a list of characters, instructions for action, words to be spoken at specific institutional positions of justice. Now, strangely enough, 
on the journey that I made from Tasmania to Broken Hill um, was, a, was at the same time that this terrible disaster occurred um, on the 5th of November 2015 in Brazil. Some of you may have heard about it, um, which was the breaking of a tailings dam, of a, of a, a, a dam that subsidiaries of VHB Billiton owned in Brazil. And this spread just toxic mud over a massive area causing deaths, displacements and pollution, the biggest, biggest pollution event that Brazil has ever um, encountered. And strangely enough, on the front of the Australian Financial Review at that time is a photograph of the, of the CEO, but he's holding, apparently holding his heart over his, sorry, holding his hand over his heart, but actually a, a colleague pointed out he's actually holding it over his liver which is quite interesting. And the liver, of course, is the organ in the body that processes um, toxicity. So um, I think we'll just kind of leave it there, really. Uh, so I think the journey, in a way, the journey that I've been interested in is, is this journey of, of what an ethical practice is and the kinds of hotspots it engages with, but also the touchstones that can come out of it, the points of coming together, the points of resolution. And with David and Yale, we are currently working on a book for UCL Press. Hopefully it will be accepted. It's had some good peer review, but we're yet to have the confirmation. But we want to try and generate this kind of um, methodology of ethical practice, starting with the hotspots and touchstones. So thank you for your patience. I think I might have to come so my voice gets picked up. Um, so we have got um, 15 to 20 minutes, just under 20 minutes, the conversation in question. Jane, I think you should stay in view. Okay. Um, I will just be the voice beside you. Do you want to sit? No, no, no you don't want to sit. Okay. They, they're wanting to see you, not me. Well, um, so can I maybe first ask if there's anyone in the room who'd like to ask a question or make a comment? For Jane, before we check in with people online. Um, Hamish. They come up there. Oh, I see. John, is it? Yeah, he needs to come to towards the mic. Okay. Yes, Jane, the mic is in front of him. Yeah, yeah, that's He's fine. Hatsi. Yeah, that's quite yeah. nice. Like, it could be a tarot tar tar yeah. read. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, thanks so much, Jane. It was a uh, lovely, uh, really exciting and interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I have one question. Uh, so one, uh, so our research project, of course, is about tacit knowledge, and one of the places that tacit knowledge comes from is Michael Polanyi's book, um, "Personal Knowledge: A Post-Critical Philosophy." Mm. So I've been thinking a lot about this issue of uh, post-criticality, mm. and mm -hmm. um, and it's because uh, Polanyi's position is a sort of anti-Kantian position against criticality as a as a type of objective knowledge, I suppose, and he's introducing the personal as a way to think about our own. As something similar perhaps to Haraway situated mm, practices, mm -hmm. but from a different philosophical tradition. And I think one, one issue I've been struggling with is about the debate maybe in the architectural academia, particularly about the critical and the yeah. post-critical yeah. and how, how to position ourselves within that debate because of, mm. I'm interested in, sorry, this is going a bit long, but I'm interested in the way that you've retained an interest in the term critical um, or uh, even, even though perhaps your critical position uh, in some ways relates to the post-critical position that was um, of such prominence in American discourse yeah. in the early yeah. 2000s. And then I'm interested in the way that the, the post-critical in, in a Polanyan sense is also perhaps related to your, mm -hmm. your critical position in the Frankfurt School. So I, so I guess I'm wondering how you situate mm. yourself in this kind of mess of, of terminology and it seems like we're not always referring to the same thing when we when we use these terms um, but it seems like you always have a very clear sense of where you where you sit in that debate so I was wondering if you could perhaps speak a little of, of, on that issue. That's a great question and I think it's actually a rather timely moment to possibly revisit that critical, post-critical mm. discussion that happened in architecture, because I think that we see it quite differently at this point mm. in time, to be honest. I think these discussions are always best 
situated historically. Mm. So in the critical architecture book, I can't remember what date that is, 2005 maybe, is it? Seven, Seven thank you. Okay. Um, I try and outline where we were at at that point in the critical architecture um, conference that I did with Murray and Jonathan Hill mm. and uh, Mark Dorian. And we all took slightly different positions on it. But in a sense, we were all arguing against the post-critical mm. because, because we saw that the way that that had been handled in the US was to, it appeared to depoliticize mm. uh, criticality. And we wanted to align ourselves with uh, politicised uh, critical discourse, which is why we were reasserting critical architecture, which of course linked back to work that Michael Hayes had been mm. doing in that way, but a very different type of criticality. And I think this is what's in your question, mm. that Hayes's work was quite oppositional mm. and the kind of architects that he was pointing to were working in a kind of negative critique mm. type of way. Mm. Whereas actually the qualities of a lot of the work that we were yeah. arguing as critical architecture could have been described in the way that the mm. post-critical describes mm. itself as yeah. being um, more speculative, mm. I guess. Though I wasn't ever quite, well, I was never really convinced by the coolness mm. of the post-critical and would always rather be on the side of the, of the hotness, mm. I think, of, yeah. the, of the, the heat of the debate of the critical. But I think... If I was to revisit that now, um, I think my understanding of what, what post anything means has really changed from a brilliant book that I read on um, the post digital, which really sets out this idea that the post isn't an afterwards as a sense of the end of something, but actually it means that once something like, if we go back to criticality, once that's been introduced, we're always in the afterwardsness mm. of criticality. So actually, I think you could, I would read the post-critical differently now mm. to say that it's the continuation mm. and development of criticality rather than its rejection. I mean, I, I don't know in your work how you're mm. going to position it, but I suppose I'd want to revisit it mm. in that way because I think that, um, I don't think that the critical can be rejected mm. I certainly wouldn't want to mm. because to me it's a very important way like I said what Frankfurt School offers mm. is as a kind of I suppose I'm very interested always as a historian of ideas to not kind of throw mm. things out that have happened before that that self-reflexivity and social awareness is so important but that you do have to reframe it and rework it according to the urgent need mm. at the present moment so I think an intersectional criticality, mm. an ecologically aware criticality, kind of work that, that Peg and others have been doing. Um, Donna Haraway's most recent writing, for me, are really vital. So addressing the kind of, you know, critical theory came out of a very particular moment in time. Mm. What, is, what is the work that we need to do um, critically now? Mm. Well, obviously it's facing some uh, terrible crises in terms of ecological uh, and biodiversity crises, but also crises around um, uh, right-wing populism as well. Yeah. I don't know if that does that answer. Absolutely, yeah. no, no. Okay. It's, I just I think it's uh, this idea of the post being after is I think such a powerful. Yeah, idea. I think I it's think actually it's, yeah. yeah. It's there's also another really um, I'm trying to think where I've written about this. In there's a book edited by Matthew Butcher. Um, and I've written an essay in that where I try and address this different way of thinking about the post, because there's another really good book um, by Compton Press on, um, I think it's called Post-Critical Pedagogies, but also makes a similar kind of term. Mm. Well, if thanks. you can't find the references, yeah. I'm happy to, uh, to share. Thanks very much. No, that's wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. thanks so much, Nilesh. Thanks, Jane. Um, does anyone else in the room want to ask a question? Okay, I can see other colleagues in the um, in the Zoom room, um, Gennaro and Galica. Um, I don't know if you want to uh, come into the conversation. Whilst people are deciding if they do, I'm just going to check the chat because there is um, there's there's okay. So we have got more space. I guess I want to. I can follow on. Okay. Um, 
So I was just thinking about actually about this sense of the post critical as a kind of afterward or mm -hmm. a space from that period of historical practice. And it's, it's revisions and it's repeats and it's remakings that I think the critical architecture book is doing. And I wanted to think about this role of the ethical and this, mm -hmm. this role of the ethical saying no. And actually that that is, so this sense that the critic is someone who recognizes positionality, but also may um, identify spaces between themselves and the other practice. But, um, but is, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I suppose what I'm questioning is this notion of a shift in the idea of opposition yeah. and that kind of fixity that actually how does an ethical practice do that criticality where it does actually open the scrutiny or it exposes or it demystifies. So I just wanted to pull on a bit from the conversation with mm. Mitch because to be honest, if you're suggesting that, and it's your work here clearly with the, with the ethological and the ethical, how, how does that interact with this idea of post critical being something that still retains the potential to um, speak differently? I, yeah, I think it's because the criticality gets formulated differently because it's dealing with constructions of subjectivity in relation to others. So I think. I mentioned earlier when I was uh, sketching through some ideas, the idea of constituent critique. Um, and I want to just make sure that I name check there, Joel Ramig, because that's his, it's his term and his work, which I found really, really helpful. Um, the thinking through constituent critique is something that's kind of quite emergent, but also is working. And he's working very much with Foucault's idea of Parisia here. Um, as a form of both self-criticism, but also social criticism. So <coughs> in these uh, formations of ethical subjectivity, or ethopoesis, self-making, one's working in dialogue or in relation in response to others, which could be institutional structures, um, but also in relation to kind of inner, inner concerns as well. So it's very much a process of self-construction and mm -hmm. social construction, and I guess poesis. And I suppose in the essay that I mentioned to Hamish, I'm forgetting the name of this essay that I wrote from his book. It's, it's to do, what I'm looking at there is how we move from a position of controlling the writing that we do when we make critical works that kind of declare positions to being controlled by the writing and being made by the writing. And I was referring there to um, Redotti and her work around autopoesis and self sort of self styling mm -hmm. and this, the kind of styling of subjectivities, which she sees as a much more productive and positive mode of criticality than, than a kind of negative critique. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I suppose I mean, I came to the Foucault work because I was really interested in, through the ethics work, really interested in governance and started to see in his work how there were these really important connections between governance, ethics and critique. Um, and that it was, it was really important in his ethics that you offer a kind of critique of governance structures. And of course, that's why I, found myself dealing with with the bulletin issue, with governance structure, working into things like um, environmental, social governance um, issues. Mm -hmm. And governance was not something that I'd kind of entered before. Um, so I think that also, that, that sort of confluence of governance ethics and critique, positioning critique in that way also became really important because of course governance involves a whole kind of bio, biopolitics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who wants to come in? Yes. Do you want to come and take the hot seat? <laughs> <laughs> so your voice is in the tarot reading. Yes, well, thank you for your, indeed a very, very exciting presentation. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, I mean, this notion of, of ethos has also uh, a connotation or significance that is related to habit and custom as well, and less to questions of ethics as, as we usually mm. discuss them. Mm. 
And in that sense, I think it also comes very close to you know, architecture's relation to everyday life habits and its way of influencing, if not shaping uh, life yeah. in that sense. Yeah. I was wondering to what extent you're also interested in this conception of ethos. And in that sense, how your work relates to um, you know, architecture's ability to you know, include, embed, or you know, however you want to call it, values, ideas, or you know, it's this kind of agency. Mm. You know, I've, I've, I've often used the word ethos. I find it a really helpful word to think about the ethos of a, of, um, a text or a, a setup. But I have, I have to say, I've not really thought properly about what the relation, relation might be between ethos and ethics. But I am, but so thank you. I think that's really helpful for me to think about. But I am really interested, yeah, in ethical practice in the sense of everyday detail. So one of the things that Yale and I discovered in our reading for, for the work we were doing was this very interesting paper on um, difficult moments. Uh, which which happen in the course of doing doing work. So a lot of the ethical protocols and guidance that one's working with in the university setting don't often pay attention to the actual detail of what goes on. And so what became really interesting to us was that the ethical moment is what emerges in the detail of what's happening, and often in the detail where it doesn't quite fit the protocol or the principle, and it's mm -hmm. it's, it's it's working against habit, perhaps, mm -hmm. or perhaps not, depending on what side of ethics your habits might be. But I think that could be an interesting thing to think to in relation to architecture. I mean, one of the things that I'm in relation to this very interested in is this, a kind of strand of feminist writing called auto theory, which is where autobiographical writing becomes a theoretical writing. Mm -hmm. So someone like Maggie Nelson, Sarah Ahmed's work could perhaps fit into that, what Sarah Ahmed actually calls a sweaty concept, where the conceptual thinking comes out of bodily lived experience. And I'm really wanting to do a project around what I'm calling the architectural but auto theory, mm. to start thinking about what the architectural implications are. So it's a bit like perhaps taking an absolute classic like Bacharel's Poetics of Space, which is a book I love and a book that I was very close to when I was studying, and starting to think what the ethopoetics mm. of architecture might be and what the ethopoetics of things like a door, a table, a chair, a window might be. Okay. So <laughs> that sort of where is, yeah, that, is that what you were kind of imagining? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I've become really interested in. Don't quite know how I'm going to do it, but I'm, I'm sketching out lots of plans. I'm well, we looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think if it's okay with everyone here and in Zoom and in other modes, we're going to thank Jane very much indeed for her really beautiful talk. And I think ending on this eco poetic promise and the sense of Jane's practice from here. Um, I'm going to draw close to today, but thank you so much, Jane. Um, I think we should do a round of applause again. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much to Jono um, yeah. for his AV uh, mastery here, but also Martin, thank you so much, and Corinna. Thanks also, obviously, to the other members of TAC. Um, who are here in the room with us uh, in the Zoom form. And, and also thanks so much to the PSRs and colleagues who are here in London. So um, great to have been here and obviously look forward to more conversations. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, thanks to everyone joining our Zoom. Thanks to <laughs> and delicate. Thanks, Jenna. Um,